Hi, I'm Jacqueline. And I'm Courtney, and this is Caffeinated Crimes. So, guys, we asked you all to send us your worst jokes because we said we were going to start the podcast with a corny joke. And you know who always comes through with corny jokes? Dads. That's who. So, my dad sent me a joke, and he's like, you asked for it. And I'm like, yes, we did. So, we're going to start with a joke. Let us know if you guys like this or if you just never want us to do this ever again. So, Courtney, why is Peter Pan always flying? Why? He never lands. Oh, my gosh. I like this joke because it never grows old. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) That is the ultimate dad joke. Yes. (laughs) Two two punchlines and all. (laughs) Right? (laughs) And my dad sends unprompted dad jokes even. So, you know, I really did ask for that one. I should have known it was coming. (laughs) But my fiance is not a dad and makes a lot of dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a cat dad. So maybe that kind of counts. But the dad jokes are unreal. Yes. Yeah. I, I like a good a good dad joke. Um, speaking of dads, Courtney, do you remember um, when I saw you for Thanksgiving and Andrew was driving and he was like, oh, well, I'm about to be a dad. So I got to listen to some dad rock now. And so mm-hmm. he starts playing some classic rock. And then we asked him when he was going to get a... a a cell phone holder for his belt loop. Yeah, and... like the belt cell phone holder. Yes. Yes. Let us know your favorite dadisms, because I love a good dadism. <laughs> so There's this one thing on TikTok, and basically, like, someone makes, like, a video, and they're like, you can stitch it, so it's, like, their video first, and then, like, your video second. And one was like, what is something that your dad always mispronounces, and, like, he knows he's mispronouncing it, but does it on <laughs> purpose? And I was like, I have one. And it's that my dad, instead of saying pico de gallo, he always says pico de gallo <laughs> every time. <laughs> and he knows it's wrong, but he just says it anyway. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. That is such a dad thing to do. Like, I know my dad has some, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. But that is such a dad thing, and I love it. Another one that's a little bit more, like, PG rated that he does. He did this once to one of my friends in high school. So my dad likes to try and like play dumb to people, like do things and like <laughs> see how they react. Like, uh-huh. so he was like the original and practical joker, I guess. But <laughs> so you know how you have like black Angus hot dogs? Uh huh. Well, um, so I had a friend come over and he just kept going, yeah, I have these like black anus hot dogs. I have these black <laughs> anus hot dogs just to see like how he would react. Oh my gosh. Oh God. It was so, so funny. So how did he react? Uh, he was just like standing there like wide eyed, like, oh my God, what do I do? <laughs> and like, and your dad has such a, like a dry sense of humor that like you really can't tell that he's joking. <laughs> Yeah, he does. And, like, he so won't, like, like, laugh either. Like, me and my mom, like, we can't tell jokes because we just, like, yeah. bust out laughing. But my dad can keep, like, the straightest face. Yes. And just, and, like, literally my dad was talking, telling this story to Kevin. And he was like, I still don't know if the guy knew I was kidding or not. <laughs> so, Courtney, while you were talking, I got distracted for a minute because I feel like this is both appropriate and inappropriate that we talked about dads before this week's episode. <laughs> Why? Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Guys. Whoops. This was not planned. Yeah. um, That's really funny. Because it was completely unplanned. (laughs) We started talking about dads. We we were just starting with our our dad joke. We didn't have anything planned. So we're telling we you about our the... good dads because we both have great dads yes. before we tell this sad dad story yes <laughs> oh my god that is so funny oh I can't believe we did that <laughs> oh god and my reaction to that was oh <laughs> at first you're like I don't get it you're like oh whoops whoopsie <laughs> so as you heard from our little revelation <laughs> we're, we're doing a family murder today yes so. so um it is the week of christmas so merry christmas if that is something that you celebrate happy, happy kwanzaa. whatever yes kwanzaa is on the 26th i see on my calendar i don't really know how kwanzaa works i'm sorry but 
That's what my calendar says. Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah is sometime in this general time frame. It begins on December 11th, according to my calendar. (laughs) Um, Winter solstice is the 21st. That's not on my calendar, but that sounds right. (laughs) Okay. Um, Yeah, so whatever winter holiday you may or may not celebrate, we're wishing you a wonderful one. But as we like to do here at Caffeinated Crimes, we wanted to have a holiday-themed episode. Um, So you guys may remember a couple weeks ago, we put on our Instagram story asking for suggestions for Christmas and New Year's. Um, And so we got a really good suggestion for Christmas. Um, So this comes from my friend Katie in North Carolina. So thank you, Katie, for the suggestion. Um, I know this is one that is fairly local to you, so I hope we have good enough information. If we miss anything, be sure and let us know, because I'm sure you probably know way more than we do. So, Yeah, and it's an old one, and I feel like... There's a lot of, like, conflicting reports or missing yes. information or he said, she said, they said, you know, all that, so. Which usually happens with the older cases, you know. Um, so, we got a lot of information from good old Murderpedia, a greensboro.com article, news.com slash au article, a planetslade.com article, a gizmodo article, and also the podcast Deadly Secrets, The Lawson Family Murders. Spoiler alert if you didn't see the title of this episode. Um, there's also a book that we were not able to find because it is now out of print. And so the ones that you can find are very expensive. And unfortunately, we, we do not have enough Patreon supporters to buy like a $150 book for one episode. So yeah. if you guys want us to do that, though, you can head on over to patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes. But in the meantime, (laughs) if you guys want to look into this book, um, it is called White Christmas, Bloody Christmas by Bruce Jones and Trudy J. Smith. Yeah. I also morbid covered this and My Favorite Murder. I went and listened to those as well just to try and get every bit of information into my brain. Yes. I listened to them before, but I re-listened and I was like, the end of the day, I was like, I cannot listen about this family anymore (laughs) because I listened to like three different podcasts in a row. I was like, yes, okay, I'm done. (laughs) In 1929, on Christmas Day, Charlie Lawson murdered his wife and six of his seven children before turning the gun on himself. So, what would cause him to do such a thing on what is supposed to be such a happy day? Let's find out. So, Charles Davis Lawson was born on May 10, 1886, to Augustus and Nancy Lawson in an unincorporated community called Lawsonville, very fitting, um, located 10 miles from Danbury, North Carolina. So Danbury is kind of like right outside of Winston-Salem, just if you're not familiar with North Carolina geography, you might know that city more. Um, In 1911, Charlie married Fanny Manring. They did have eight children together, um, but unfortunately their third child, William, who was born in 1914, um, died of an illness when he was six years old in 1920. So in 1918, Charlie moved the family to a farm in Germantown, which is in Stokes County, North Carolina. So they worked as sharecroppers, and they made enough money to buy their own farm in 1927. So 1929 was a rough winter in Stokes County with frigid temperatures and a very heavy snowfall. And two weeks before Christmas that year, Charlie took his wife and seven children into Winston-Salem to buy new clothes and to have a family portrait taken. Um, So the family was fairly poor, so this was a really extravagant purchase for them. Um, And he told them that it was part of a, quote, Christmas surprise, which just... Gives me chills. I don't like that. (laughs) Um, Yeah. He was also reported to have said there would be no presents for Christmas that year because of this surprise. So they're expecting something other than a present, which they got, but I don't think it was the surprise they planned on. So on Christmas morning, um, the family was at home cooking and preparing the home for Christmas festivities. So they planned to go to Charlie's brother's house later in the day. And Charlie's nephew had stayed the night the night before, and him and his oldest son, who was 16-year-old Arthur, asked Charlie if he had any shotgun shells so they could go rabbit hunting. So Charlie told them that he did not have any shotgun shells, and he sent them to walk down to the local area, Walnut Cove, to buy some. So we did mention in the beginning that Charlie murdered his whole family, but just as an FYI, trigger warning for very brutal child death if you want to skip some details. So, after Arthur left, Charles waited by the tobacco barn until two of his daughters passed by on their way to their aunt and uncle's house. 
So as they approached him, Charlie shot and killed 12-year-old Carrie Lee and 7-year-old Maybell, and then bludgeoned them. He then returned to their cabin, where his wife, 37-year-old Fanny, was on the porch and shot and killed her as well. Inside the cabin, he shot and killed his 17-year-old daughter, Marie, and the crime scene indicates that his younger sons probably witnessed Marie's death and had started running away, and Charlie chased them down and then bludgeoned to death his four-year-old son, James, his two-year-old son, Raymond, and his three-month-old daughter, Mary Lou. So he also bludgeoned his wife and 17-year-old daughter after shooting them. And I think Morbid said as well, I don't know, I'm going to reference them because I don't know where they got this, like, detail, but um, I'm pretty sure they said that, like, afterwards, like, the gun was literally bent because of how bad he'd bludgeoned them. Ugh. Like, it was, like, destroyed because he had so violently Ugh. bludgeoned them. So, something else that's interesting, um, after murdering his whole family, um, he placed pillows under all the victims' heads and crossed their arms across their chest. Um, he moved the bodies of his daughters outside into the barn and placed rocks under their heads, like, as a pillow, and crossed their arms as well. Some reports say that he placed stones on the eyes of all of them. Some say, some don't mention it, so we're not really sure. So, rabbit hunting was common in the area, so any gunshots heard on the farm that morning probably wouldn't cause any suspicion. Um, but later that morning, Charlie's brother Elijah and his sons came to visit for Christmas and discovered the bodies. So the cabin was just covered in blood and the rooms were like really messy and just kind of in disarray. Um, authorities arrived and they began searching for Charlie because at this point they don't know if he was the murderer, if he had also been murdered, had he been kidnapped, like what is this? Um, but word did soon reach Arthur at the store and so they sent someone to pick him up and bring him home. So while the farm was being searched, they heard a gunshot in the woods. So following the sound, they found Charles' body. And there were two notes in his pockets, and both were written on tobacco auction receipts. And the first said, quote, trouble can cause, dot, dot, dot. And the other said, quote, nobody to blame. And that was it. Which is very eerie. Yes. Like, what the hell was going through his head? Like, and was that it? Were you planning on writing more, and then you were interrupted because people arrived, and you were going to get caught, or... Are you on a psychotic break? And to you, these two notes made sense yeah. somehow. Yeah. Like, Which we'll talk a little bit later about what may or may not have been going through his brain. Um, so evidence would show that after murdering his family, Charlie then went into the woods with two shotguns and his two dogs. And he stopped and washed the blood from his hands in a nearby creek. And his footprints in the snow would show that he circled around a tree for hours before shooting himself. So I don't know if he just wasn't ready to kill himself, if he was panicking, if killing himself was part of his plan all along or not, and then people arrived. Who really knows? But it did, there was some time between killing everyone else and killing himself. Yeah, because I think a lot of people, like, had already showed up, and then, like, they heard him, like, shoot the shot that killed himself. So, yes, who knows what he was doing. I know a lot of people, like, speculate, like, oh, he paced around talking to himself, or he struggled, and it's like, okay, but we don't know, because yes. he's dead. <laughs> exactly. We have no idea what was going on in his brain any of this time. Um, so, as I mentioned before, it was a very rough winter, and the snow was so deep on the mountain that it was really difficult for them to climb up and down, um, so friends, relatives, and the deputies had to wrap the bodies in bed sheets and create, like, a sled to get the bodies to the bottom of the hill, which is just so... Ugh, I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, that is not what you want on Christmas Day. No, that is not the kind of sledding you want. Uh, no, no, I'm gonna pass on that one. Um, so they did have a hearse waiting at the bottom of the road that took the bodies into town. So the bodies were ultimately taken to two different funeral homes because the first one was just too small to be able to handle eight bodies at once. So they had to go to the one, the bigger one, in the larger town nearby. So. The Stokes County coroner was Dr. C.J. Helzebeck of Danbury, um, and the brother of the county sheriff, Dr. Spotswood Taylor of Johns Hopkins Medical Center, was home for Christmas, and he assisted with the autopsies that night as well. So Charlie's brain was removed, and Dr. Taylor transported it back to Johns Hopkins in a jar of formaldehyde for further research. 
So the initial autopsy findings showed that Charles' brain was smaller than usual and that a portion in the center was underdeveloped. So five hearses arrived on December 27th to transport the eight bodies to a mass grave at Browder Cemetery. Um, This part is just so incredibly sad. So they only buried seven caskets because they put the baby Mary Lou in with her mother. Just, just, I can't. Just heartbreaking, yeah. So thousands of visitors arrived to town to see the caskets being lowered into the grave. So clearly fascination with true crime is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on for a long time. Yeah, and the fascination in this case gets real deep. I'm going to tell you about it. So after the funeral... Uh, Charlie's brother Marion opened the cabin for tours and since so many people were coming he was like I'm gonna charge people 25 cents to come and just see this grisly crime scene which was still covered in blood like the blood was all still there it was not cleaned up Um, and I guess he was like all these people keep coming like I'm gonna make some money to try and help save like the family farm Mm -hmm. or you know keep it for Arthur um so while it's kind of gross that he did that, I'm hoping he had good intentions of just like, yeah. here, you need some money because your father just killed all your siblings and your mom yeah. and himself. Like, So they even had souvenir pamphlets for sale that included a poem about the murders as well as souvenir photos. And it like just detailed like basically everything that happened that day. And the home was seeing about 500 tours today, which was a lot of money. Yes. So especially like... Back then, like, I'm sure he made more money just doing this rather than having a farm. So, uh, on the morning of Christmas Day before they were murdered, um, Marie had baked a cake. Um, so that cake was still there sitting on the counter. And she had put raisins on the cake, which I guess was a thing Mm -hmm. back then. Um, and they had to actually cover it because so many people kept taking raisins from the cake for, like, a souvenir. Which is just... Why a raisin? Like, that thing's going to mold exactly. and disappear. Like, what are you going to do like, with that? You're going to, I mean, there's other things that we talk about later that became, like, family heirlooms that were, like, passed down to generations in this area. But a raisin? Like, what are you going to do with a raisin? And, like, you can't prove, like, this raisin was from that cake. Okay, well, you could have just gotten that raisin from the local, like, market. Right. <laughs> like, how do we know this is, like, like no, from this was that? from Marie's cake. How are you going to prove that? This isn't, like, 2020. You couldn't take a <laughs> selfie of you like, taking the raisin. <laughs> and it was funny because when Courtney and I started doing the research for this case, like, we both knew some portions of it, but we couldn't remember, like, all the details because, unfortunately, as we've mentioned before, so many crimes run together because there's so many of them. But this detail stuck out to both of us. Like, this is the one thing that both of us, like, distinctly remembered was people taking the raisins off this cake. Yeah, because I can't remember which... My one episode that I re-listened to, and I was like, oh, this is, like, old-timey. I remember there was this one, and it was, like, people were taking raisins off the cake, and then I swear, like, five minutes later, the podcast was like... And there was a raisin cake. And I was like, oh, this is the same one. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, this is it. Um, so five years after the murder, one of Charlie's brothers took the cake home and buried it. I also heard reports that it was auctioned off and then the person who won it threw it in the woods. Oh, okay. So I don't really know which one's accurate. Um, but something happened with that cake. It was, uh, it, it's no longer there. You can't steal the raisins anymore. <laughs> Um, So infamous gangster John Dillinger even visited the crime scene uh, tourist attraction when he was on the run from the law. And in January of 1930, the Lawson family belongings were auctioned off and people just couldn't get enough of them. Um, The shotguns Charles used to murder his family were the most sought after items. And Lawson family memorabilia was also later taken to county shows for people to see. So this isn't new. Like people were obsessed. And it kind of reminds me... Like in Bonnie and Clyde, yes. like when they had the car and they would just like take it around like with their mothers and be like, it's the moms of Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and the car look where that they their were murdered. children died in. So let weird. me let make you relive your child's death every day yes. for public attraction. Which also like poor Arthur too. Because yes. I'm sure like everyone being obsessed with it and like you probably have horrible survivor's guilt yeah. first off. Like also, I mean, there was not really like therapy or like recognition for like mental health issues back then Mm -hmm. it was kind of like all right suck it up move on so i'm sure this was so hard to just see people like prancing around the house where everyone was murdered people like taking your things like 
You didn't even get to eat the cake because <laughs> Charlie murdered everyone. Like, that sucks. I did read, though, that um, Arthur actually went to the county shows as well. So kind of a similar thing with, like, Bonnie and Clyde's parents. And But, again, was it something of, like, he just needed money or he's like, what the hell yeah. else do I do? I mean. Yeah, and or, like, at least if I go, like, they'll kind of tell the story. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I can tell, like about my family yes. and not just let everyone like run wild with stories. Yeah. Um, and so at this time, murder ballads were common and these songs would just kind of describe the events of a crime. Um, and a lot of times these would kind of be sung to kids as lullabies. So like you'd be putting your little baby to sleep and just singing about a murder. You know, um, it happens, I guess. Casual. So, in March of 1930, Walter Kidd Smith wrote the song Murder of the Lawson Family and recorded it with the Carolina Buddies for Columbia Records. And this album was a huge hit for Columbia Records, and it was selling more records than any other bluegrass album had at that point. So, people have always loved murders, guys. So, the Carolina Buddies would even go and play this song at the cabin, like, during the tours. Yeah. Like, it was, it was a whole production. <laughs> Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and give you the lyrics from this song. So, his name was Charlie Lawson, and he had a loving wife, but they never knew what caused him to take his family's life. They say he killed his wife at first, while the little one did cry, please, Papa, won't you spare us, how it is so hard to die. But the raging man could not be stopped. He would not heed their call. He kept on firing shots, and there he killed them off. Which is kind of... Ugh disgusting because like you're also like talking about these children yes like you're taking very like artistic different you know what I mean like oh this is what the kids said and like how sad they were and like this was a big hit like like people loved this happening? song this was like a thing okay so Courtney I hope you laughed at my note in here <laughs> so yeah Courtney don't read this <laughs> okay I was like which part all of it <laughs> Courtney stop reading the rest of it okay so, Courtney, trigger warning, a death happened. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was doing this research on murder ballads in general, I found one that was called The Knoxville Girl, which I had never heard I've of. I've heard of this. Damn it, never mind. I know. I saw your note and I was like, oh no, she's going to be mad. <laughs> I don't remember. I think it was some podcast. I'm not sure. Like, I'd heard somehow yeah. heard about like this Knoxville like base. I had never murder heard of this. So... Okay, Courtney, pretend you don't know about it, and I'm just going to read you a couple of lyrics here. I'll be the listeners. <laughs> oh my god, Knoxville. I've never been there or heard of it. How cool. <laughs> Tell me more about this place I don't give a shit about. I will, Courtney. Actually, if I'm being the listeners, Knoxville is our only listener. <laughs> True. It's all our friends and family. True. So this one's for just all kidding. you guys. I know there's others of you out there. <laughs> um, so there was a murder ballad called The Knoxville Girl. And it first came out by Arthur Tanner and his Corn Shuckers, just the most Knoxville name for a band ever, um, in 1927. <laughs> and so basically it's kind of about this guy that was in love with this girl and then murdered her. Um, but some of the lyrics say, We went to take an evening walk about a mile from town. I picked a stick up off the ground and knocked that fair girl down. And every Sunday evening out in her home I dwell. One line says, Oh, Willard, dear, don't kill me here. I'm unprepared to die. And the song ends, Go down, go down, you Knoxville girl, with a dark and roving eye. Go down, go down, you Knoxville girl. You can never be my bride. So, I just wanted to. And these were like the hit songs of the Yeah, day. people liked these so songs. Like, this was like, the, this was a bop. If you're offended by WAP, <laughs> like, I don't know. I think I'd rather listen to WAP than, uh. <laughs> Knoxville girl, you're gonna die. Like, details of so. horrific murders, yeah. Which, I mean, we have a podcast about details of horrific murders, so I don't know if we can't say anything. I mean, true. We don't sing it, though. At least we have a lot of, like, documentaries and, like, facts now, and not just, like, hey, Charlie Lawson, he killed his family, <laughs> his kids cried. Okay, well, yeah, they're dying. Jesus, dude. And we do try to, you know, give facts and not so much just sensationalism you know yeah and if we like say something that we don't have like a firm report on like we try to be sure yes let you guys definitely. know definitely 
and not just be like, Charlie sat there and talked for a long time to himself about blah, blah, blah. We don't know that. There's not like a hidden camera. So yeah. Anyway, back on topic. <laughs> um, so no one will ever really know exactly why Charlie Lawson just murdered his whole family on Christmas. Um, we don't really know if how long he'd planned to do it. Um, any of that. I mean, if he planned to do it, like we know there was a whole Christmas surprise yeah. thing, but maybe that was something else. Maybe it was a happy surprise and then he went crazy. I don't know. I don't know. We don't really know. I do think that the family portrait like leads to the fact that it had le- at least been planned for those couple of weeks, you know, because it just yeah. seems so I agree, but also like it's possible. Yeah. I mean, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um so of course, as we all love to do, we love to theorize as to why this happened. And so a lot of theories have popped up over the years. Um, so a lot of witnesses do say that Charlie Lawson had been behaving very erratically in the months before the murders. And he is also reported to have complained to his doctor, um, who was the Dr. Hellesbeck that performed the autopsies, that he was suffering from severe headaches and insomnia. As someone who's had migraines, they will make you go crazy. <laughs> like... Um, and he was reported to have accidentally struck himself in the forehead with an axe one day while working on the farm. Now, we all know the frontal lobe is very important. Yes. And we all know head injuries are not great. So no one knows exactly when this occurred. Um, and it could have been weeks or even years before the murder. Um, but some say his behavior changed after that. So as we mentioned, um, the doctor did take his brain back to John Hopkins so they did look at it and they said they didn't notice any like trauma to it like it was abnormally small um some portions were kind of underdeveloped but there were no signs of like physical trauma to explain the scenario but i also kind of want to point out this is like 1929 1930 so how accurate is it like you can't really do like i'm assuming they didn't really have like the ct scans we have today like there may have been something that just wasn't and if it happened years before, maybe it could have healed. I don't know. Yeah, it's like the science was so primitive then. I mean, maybe if it had happened like right before, you would be able to tell. But you probably, and we're guessing because we are not neuroscientists, um, you probably would not be able to tell at that point like any long-term physical damage, you know? Yeah, and it's like how many brains had they looked at at this yeah. point? Like what is like the standard you know for the medical community like are we still back here like measuring people's heads to determine their intelligence you know like that like old science um uh but also a little fun fact though the current location of charlie lawson's brain is unknown yeah i thought that was interesting maybe somebody out there just has his (laughs) brain in a jar in their home i mean they did like their souvenirs so they're like this is the best one (laughs) I mean, if you're going to take a raisin, you're probably going to take the brain. (laughs) I mean, I'd take a brain over a raisin, you know? that's Yeah, I mean, it's more legit. Yeah, right? You You can't just buy a brain in the market. Well, I mean, the dark web, maybe. I don't know, but... I don't know. Don't let us know where you guys can buy a brain, because I don't really want to know that information. Please don't send me one. (laughs) I don't want that fan gift. So, there were some other reports that he did have a painful tumor on his chest, and like he didn't want to die without his family and so he was like uh you know i don't really care to die from this like tumor on my chest but i want to take my whole family with me Mm -hmm. pretty selfish um but there really isn't much to substantiate this theory yeah but a lot of people did point to the eeriness of the family photo to be like this was his way of saying if i can't have them nobody can and i just want to like Mm -hmm immoralize my family with this photo so everyone will always remember us you know yeah and be like there has to be a picture of us to like go on forever yeah so in 1990 bruce jones and his daughter trudy smith started writing a book about the lawson family murders called white christmas bloody christmas so bruce was from the area and he was like eight years old at the time of the murders. so he kind of you know he grew up around all that And he's always fascinated by them, and he just wanted to interview extended family members. So, right before the book was published, one of Charles' nieces, Stella, contacted Trudy. And she said that she had some very juicy information that could explain why Charlie acted the way he did. Yes. So, 
She said that Marie had told her that her father was molesting her and she had found out she was pregnant right before the murders. So, that's, I mean, I don't know if I want to say it's reason to kill your whole family, but that's a pretty... Uh, it's a motive. It's a motive for sure. Yeah. Um, and so many speculate that Charlie murdered his family out of shame or fear of being found out. Like, if people find out that I got my daughter pregnant or I'm abused, like, I'm having incestual relationship, like, with my daughter. Mm-hmm. And if, if it's just one daughter, I can't imagine it would just be her. Like, yeah. I, mean, I would be, like, molesting the other kids as well. So, you know, kind of like, I'm going to be found out. I have to just, sh- like, kill this before. Yeah. Ooh, that was a bad, bad choice of word. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, so Stella said several family members were aware of the ongoing abuse, um, but no official autopsy reports have ever been released to indicate that the daughter was pregnant. Um, so I'm not really sure, like, I don't know how far along she would have been and like, if you would have even looked for that, you know, at this like 1920 autopsy. And if it was not that far along, would you even be able to recognize like... You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I mean, with her being shot and bludgeoned, like, how much of the body is left to examine in that kind of detail, you know? So if she was, like, mm-hmm. newly pregnant, then is it, like you said, is it far enough along for them to be able to tell at that point in time with that little to work with? Um, and also, I mean, there is the possibility that she just thought she was pregnant, but she actually wasn't. So she brought up the abuse to her cousin because she thought she was pregnant, but maybe she really wasn't because it's not like you can just go down to the Dollar Tree and get a dollar pregnancy test and find out for sure. You know, so maybe, like, she missed her period, it was late, maybe she was having some weird symptoms, whatever, and she's like, oh, I think I'm pregnant. But, I mean, at that point, you wouldn't know for sure until, like, you felt the baby move, you know? Yeah. And, like, that's the thing, too. If she just, like, missed her period, I mean, it's not going to look like the baby you see when it comes out nine months later. And, like, I know in autopsies today, they really, like, look at, like, every organ, everything. And I don't know if they did that back in the day. Yeah. You know, with these, like, early autopsies, if they were just, like, looking, like, I mean, it's kind of clear what happened here. Exactly. I'm like, you don't need to, like, it's not like you just found this body and there's no sign of injury. And you're like, we don't know what happened. Like, she was pretty clearly shot and bludgeoned. Like, we know cause of death pretty easily here. And, like, the mindset back then of, like, a 17-year-old unmarried girl, you would never think she's pregnant. Yeah. Exactly. So you would never look for it. Yeah. So we don't know for sure. Um, and, of course, even if she was not pregnant, it, like, it doesn't prove that he wasn't molesting his daughter. Mm-hmm. So just because, you know, she wasn't pregnant, you know, it could still be happening. And, you know, several family members did, you know, say they were aware of that abuse. Yeah. So interviewed family members also reported that one time Charlie said he wouldn't mind dying if it meant he could take his family with him. So, kind of eerie. Yeah. And I'm not sure if we mentioned it. Also, when they went shopping that day with the family picture, they bought clothes. And those were the clothes they were buried in, which I yeah. feel like is also very sad. Very sad. Don't like that. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, eventually the cabin was torn down. And the wood from the home was used to build a covered bridge on the farm. So, that's that seems very haunted to me. But... The funeral home where the autopsies were performed is now a store called Madison Dry Goods with a museum upstairs that is dedicated to the Lawson family murder. And many report feeling eerie feelings here and have even described seeing the ghost of a little girl in a white dress. So in 1945, Arthur Lawson died at the age of 31 in a car accident in Walnut Grove. He did have a wife and four children of his own at the time of his death. Um, According to the Deadly Secrets podcast, Arthur's descendants have settled in California. Which is just so sad that you, like, survived the mass murder of your family only to die 17 years later in a car accident, you know? Yeah, that is really sad. And um, just as a final note, there is a Facebook group, um, The Lawson Family Murders, and it has, like, 3,000 members, so many claim to be distant relative of the Lawsons or do have distant relatives who lived in the area at the time. Um, so there's just many conversations, theories, weirdness <laughs> thrown around there. Um, so if that's something that interests you, if you're somehow a distant relative or think you are or 
I don't know, want to be, um, <laughs> you can check that out. Want to claim to be on the internet, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a private, quote, Facebook group. Like, you have to apply to be a member to, like, post and stuff. But you can, like, I was able to, like, read through all the posts and comments and everything. And, I mean, it's really interesting because a lot of it seems like it's legit. Like, they're like, oh, my such and such great, great whatever lived mm-hmm. down the street and said this. And, you know, and I'm sure there's some that, like, they're just making up bullshit just to have fun on the internet. But I'm sure there's some truth to a lot of it that they're just trying to connect with other either distant family members or people who were in the area at the time. But, I mean, it's just kind of an interesting place to um, to browse through, take it with a grain of salt, obviously. Yeah, and I don't know if, like, applying to, like, post, if you have to provide some proof, you know? Like, yeah, I don't know. Please show us, like, something that could actually, like make sense that yeah. you are a relative and not just um joe smith from montana who's never been nor- <laughs> near north carolina you know those joe smiths from montana they're always getting into shit you gotta watch them out you gotta watch out they're dangerous <laughs> so yeah this one is just so like sad yeah like on christmas day and your whole family and and a lot of people in the facebook group claim to be you know, distant relatives of people that knew him, and they're like, no one ever thought anything bad of him before this. Like, he seemed just like a normal guy. Like, this didn't seem within his character, which I'm not sure how many people you would be like, yeah, that seems like the guy that would murder his whole family. You know, you don't really think that about people. Um, Yeah. So, you know, you do question, like, did he have some kind of brain injury? Um, You know, was there some kind of tumor in the brain that they couldn't see at the time of the autopsy because maybe it was so small that they weren't able to determine it at in 1930 you know like or maybe he was just an asshole that just murdered his whole family for no reason we'll never know yeah and that's what sucks is so many of these especially old ones or even though you know it's solved we know what happened like and the unsolved ones it's so like frustrating because you just don't know why you don't know the why of like why it happened is like I think that's the thing a lot of us want is just to be like, okay, well, I can rationalize that this won't happen to me because yes. my husband's not cheating on me <laughs> or I don't have a husband. I don't know, whatever. So you can like justify and be like, okay, well, that wouldn't happen to me. But like this one, it's like so random. You yeah. just don't know. When there's no reason, no motive. There's no clear. You're just like, why? What? You know. But yeah, if you guys are local to that area and you know more either facts or just substantial theories or you know whatever definitely reach out to us and let us know because yeah we all or like even just like a story in general like you know my great great grandmother used to hang out with marie or you know yeah. what i mean like because i'm sure there's that like people who knew the kids yeah and knew the mom absolutely Oh, well, that's a sad one. Um, So hopefully your Christmas day goes better than that. Um, Courtney, please, I hope so. (laughs) Courtney, what is your perk of the week? Okay, my perk of the week is very on brand. (laughs) So my perk of the week is caffeine. That's a good in general, coffee, Red Bull, any form of caffeine I can get. Um, I have been very, very fortunate that my work has been busy, and so I've been working a lot of overtime Mm -hmm. um and so I've had a lot of late nights early mornings lack of sleep and so just thank god for coffee because I couldn't survive without it (laughs) and poor Courtney had to also wake up early on this Sunday morning to record with me because I have to get to my new house and get stuff done today so I'm like sorry Courtney can we record early so you know just don't worry I already have my nap planned later it's fine (laughs) what I do is I watch the Titans gain then the 425 games start, I take a little nap. <laughs> <laughs> Works out perfect. That's, I mean, that was usually how my Sundays would go because we would watch the Bengals game, and then if we would win, Andrew and I would drink a bottle of champagne, so I would involuntarily take a nap during the 425 games. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But yes, thank God for caffeine. It has been what keeps me running through all this. Speaking... keep me running until then. <laughs> yes. Speaking of caffeine, today's going to be a good day for me because um, I cut back to half caffeinated coffee when I found out I was pregnant, which has been very difficult because 
again, I mean, we wouldn't have named this podcast Caffeinated Crimes for nothing. We both really like caffeine. Um, And yesterday, Walmart did not have a single thing of half-calf coffee. No brand, flavor, nothing. They didn't have a single one. So I'm drinking full calf today. So, you know, we're just, we're going for it. I'm telling you, every time I open Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, someone else is announcing their pregnancy. (laughs) So everyone's drinking half-calf, I guess. But yeah, and so thank God for caffeine, half calf, decaf, <laughs> any calf, <laughs> um, all the calves, <laughs> all the calves. Um, so Jacqueline, what's your perk of the week? Um, so my perk of the week, as I mentioned last week, that we closed on our house, so we are in the process of kind of slowly moving in, kind of getting things at the house ready before we do like our big move this upcoming weekend. Um, so yesterday, Andrew spent all day at the house painting, um, so he's kind of my perk of the week for doing all this painting for me, because I can't paint right now. Um, and the house didn't really, like, need painting, I just, I have been renting for almost nine years, and so I just really wanted to, like, paint every room a different color, because I can, and because this man loves me so much, he did that for me, so... He is my perk of the week and also my lovely painted home, um, my new office that I'm going to be recording in that is like this beautiful teal color and I love it. And he's painting my bedroom green today and like this really pretty gray and like the rest of the, it just looks so good and I'm just so happy with it and with him for doing that for me. So yeah, that's my perk of the week. That's (laughs) exciting. I love, (laughs) I love how Andrew's not my perk of the week when it comes to having a baby, but painting the room, then he's my perk of the week. (laughs) Hey, anyone could impregnate you. <laughs> Not everyone can paint a room Not for you. Not everyone would paint a room for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's oh, exciting. Boy. Houses and colors and doing whatever you want. And I think we talked about that. Obviously, Jacqueline doesn't have an HOA that we found out about yet. Yes, you can paint your house pink if you want. <laughs> yeah, there's no HOA because I would not buy a home with an HOA. So can paint that house whatever color I want. But also, Courtney, do you remember in the Lizzie Borden episode... We talked about how she named her new home Maplecroft, and I was like, when we buy a home, we're going to have to name it, so we got to come up with a name for the home. Courtney's thinking. She's doing her, like, closed eyes, like... Oakwood Manor. (laughs) I don't know. Sounds like a nursing home. (laughs) (laughs) It will be one day, I guess, when you're old. (laughs) I was was about to say... There's a nursery. I was... (laughs) I was about to say um, what the name of the neighborhood is to come up with something with that, but it's a really small neighborhood, so I don't think I should announce that. <laughs> but yeah, let's not announce that. We'll come up with something. If you have any ideas of what we should name Jacqueline's house, yes, email us at caffeinatedcrimespod at gmail.com. Message us on Instagram at caffeinatedcrimespod. Yes. At Caffeinated Crimes Pod, uh, on Twitter at Caff Crimes Pod, that's C A F F Crimes Pod, or at Facebook, which is just Caffeinated Crimes Podcast. Um, and you can also, if you want to be like one on one with us, ask us in our QA what we're going to name Jacqueline's uh, <laughs> house or have a Google Hangout with us, whatever. Um, you can do so by supporting us at patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes. And um, y'all are really slacking with the iTunes reviews. Like, we need to get on this, okay? <laughs> So, yeah, we haven't got a single one. It's okay, guys. I like, when we started this contest, I think we got, like, two that week, and we haven't yeah. gotten any more since then. Um, so, if And you that's guys... how people find us, and that's how, you know, if we get more people, if we get, you know, we're able to get sponsors or more Patreons, like, hopefully we'll be able to, like, do more for you guys or release more or, like, buy a $160 book to yes. give you the details. You know, whatever. Get better, you know, soundproofing equipment to make the audio sound better. Whatever. Um, so, please, 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 if you can, on any device that you own, um, unfortunately, it has to be Apple because that's just the biggest in terms of podcast reviews, like Spotify, Stitcher, things like that. They don't really have reviews, so it kind of doesn't, like, work with them. Um, but yeah. go to Apple Podcasts. Make sure you leave us um, a rating and a review. Five stars is preferable. Um, really, if you're going to do less than, like, four, just <laughs> don't bother things. Uh, maybe that's why no <laughs> one's leaving us reviews. So, like, I can't give you a five star, so <laughs> I'll just pass. I mean, if you want to give us a three star, it's okay. Just give us uh, constructive criticism. Yes. Don't be mean. 
But go do that, and once we reach 50 of those, which apparently is never going to happen, but if it ever does, we will draw a winner to get a sticker, a pin, and a gift card to a coffee shop of your choice. So please head on over and do that. It would be much appreciated. Yeah, and in the meantime, go have a cup of coffee. And don't commit a crime. <laughs>